Yeah, just a, a, a brief what the course is about, what you're doing. Well, the course, do you know what? I've forgotten the blooming name of it now, but it's the official course. That, uh, the, apparently, there's only two operators in the UK that are authorised by the CAA to do these courses um, uh, with the idea that you can then go on and use these things commercially. Yeah. Um, it's a two-day course. Uh, it's run by Euro UAS, I think uh, is the name of the company. Uh, it's a two-day course. I did mine at Heathrow, uh, a hotel opposite Heathrow, and um, it's really intensive. And I've got to say, because at the end of the course, you then do a, an exam, mm -hmm. um, and I decided after the end of the course to defer the exam until January because uh, the, because of the map reading yeah. element of it. Uh, the only they only actually spend an hour doing the map reading and if you've never done or if you've never worked with aeronautical maps before uh, an hour's not enough and um, that, that was a bit of feedback that I gave them on the course but uh, so I'm gonna uh, swat up on the uh, map reading side of it and then and then sit the exam in in uh, January uh, so so you have to do that the two-day course like I say it's really really intensive and the it, at first, when I started the exam, uh, started the course, I, I was a little bit sceptical as to why you need to know all the stuff that they teach you. But then by the end of it, I've got to be honest, I actually, it all started to make sense. And if you are doing this stuff commercially, there are some really important things that you need to know. Uh, just, just some very obvious ones like not flying over crowds, not flying in built up areas, um, but also knowing where you are because you could get a commission from somebody to do some aerial photography or whatever um, and not know that you're in a military restricted area or that you're by a nuclear power plant for instance. Apparently there was an incident, they, they, on the course they, they brought that up that some there was re recently an incident where somebody had, had flown their DGI Phantom um, near a nuclear power plant which is a big no-no. Yeah. Because they're not part of the um, flight, the, the flight um, path rules with the software. It does the, all the um, airports, but not actually the. Well, they probably don't even. I mean, they do show on the aeronautical maps, but they might not necessarily show on other things. And yeah. um, because they're restricted areas, they don't want uh, terrorists uh, doing reconnaissance over them, basically. So yeah, you can imagine that uh, they're a bit jittery about that sort of stuff. Um, but there's all sorts of things like not flying near uh, final approaches at airports. I mean, where we are right now, we're stood in deep cut. Uh, how many airports are we surrounded by? Mm. Um, you know, you've got Heathrow not that far away. There's an air... So if you turn your camera around now, I mean, that aircraft, you might not pick up on your fisheye lens there. Um, but th there's two aircraft in yeah, that frame right the, now. So yeah. Um, and actually, uh, there was an aircraft that went over earlier that um, you know could easily you could easily get your DGI up there no problem at all at the same sort of altitude. We've got a lot of people actually extending the aerial so they can go further and fly higher. Yeah, which is a, obviously a bit sort of um, concern. Yeah, absolutely. So um, so actually, having done the two day course, I n I now actually think that it's a good idea, and anybody that wants to do this sort of stuff commercially needs. Well, you have to buy by law really you have to you have to do this course um, so after once you've done the exam they then then the third part of the uh, the whole setup is that you have to do a flight manual much like you would have to do for a real aircraft mm. every aircraft has its own flight manual and in there uh, you record everything all the spare parts that you might buy for it and you'll log uh, even down to every time you charge the battery mm. So you can see the state of your batteries and all that sort oh, of stuff. Oh, that's a new feature Phantom has now. It looks at the battery status and records that over time. Right. So that's on, on the app, so you can recall that back any time. Oh, really? Well, that's yeah. useful to know. Uh, it's very useful to know for the uh, for the flight manual. But but again, under the CAA regulations, if you're doing this stuff commercially, you've got to keep a flight manual. Yeah. And there's there's so much involved. It. I could, couldn't possibly cover it all on this interview, but... Um, so once you've done the flight manual, they you, they send you a, a kind of template and you have to populate that with your yeah. own stuff. Uh, they then decide whether it's suitable for submission to the CAA and then they approve that. Yeah. And if uh, that's all fine, then you then go on and do a, a, a practical flight. And you have to drive to Gloucester to do this because at the moment that's the only place they do okay. it. You have to drive to Gloucester. They tell you you need at least two fully charged batteries for the for the flight exam. Yeah. Um, 
and yeah you're with an instructor and uh, they go through various scenarios to make sure that you're competent to fly the thing mm. uh, in a commercial environment and once you've done that you then they then say to the CAA yes we think this person is suitable uh, for uh, permission to fly and uh, apparently it takes a couple of weeks after that and then the CAA issue you with permission to fly which is only valid for a year you then have to recertify every year it's the same with the course and you do a course um, as well a refresher yeah it, it, uh, I don't I'm not I don't know whether you have to do a refresher course but you just have to uh, recertify I think you have to submit your uh, manual and yeah. they look at your manual to make sure that you everything's okay and uh, for instance, you mentioned, I don't know if you've covered this on your channel yet, but you mentioned earlier that uh, you had a, an adverse incident with your DJI yeah. and, it, and it fell out of the sky. Well, under CAA regulations, if you have a permission to fly, if that incident happens, you have to report that to the CAA every time there's a, an incident. No matter how serious or not serious it is, you have to log every single okay. incident. So, for instance, if you have a flyaway, you have to report that. Um, and, uh, and actually, there's more flyaways with these things than you might think. There's a lot of popular chat on the YouTube channels now. A lot of people are saying talking about flyaways quite a bit. There's a lot happening, um, and I think that DJR probably, as they with the, the, the new firmware updates, that they'll, they'll become fewer as they realise what what are causing the flyaways. But a lot of it is to do with new firmware updates. Well, you got the Flytrek software. You can purchase and buy it and add to your Phantom, which is your flight plan stuff. So that right. records your flights. Uh, live and that sends it through your mobile phone up on the web so you can then look at your flight plan you, you do and now the Inspire One now has the flight plan built into their app yeah. so you, you can record and see what, where you're flying all the time yeah. so maybe I think that's what they're probably trying to achieve is get up to the, raw, the regulations yeah you know. I mean um, you know it's a, it's a fantastic bit of kit uh, they're, they're great fun but they do they, they do have a serious commercial element to them um, you know why why would you commission a helicopter flight to do aerial photography that could cost several thousand pounds when you can do this for a couple of hundred quid yeah you know uh, but my, my advice would be to any company considering this uh, you know commissioning somebody to do this sort of stuff is to make sure that you are commissioning somebody who is who has a permission to fly yeah because if you don't then if you have public liability insurance it's, it's void mm. before they even fire up the motors your public liability insurance is void okay. and that's not, they, these are the type of things that they cover on the course so it's good to be on the course and find out what's absolutely yeah. and the, the, the trouble is is that i think that the, it's very expensive the course i mean uh, i think by the time you've um you you've actually done the flight exam and you've got your permission to fly you've probably done the best part of 1500 quid so, I can't bet. so, so it's, it's a lot it's a serious money. thing if you want to. it's yeah you know you need to think it through you really do need to think it through um, and apparently quite a lot of people fail it it's not something that they uh, you know if you think you're gonna go on the course and just because you paid the money you think they're gonna make it easy for you they don't mm -hmm. um, it's not like that at all and quite a lot of people fail the first time and have to do it uh, you know have to keep resitting yeah. it until they get it right um, and it's money every time you do that. <laughs> but any, any hobby you get, it's going to be expensive anyway. Yeah. So it's. Um, well, this, but you know, um, if you're doing the course, it's not for a hobby. Mm. You're doing it because you wanna you want to um, make money out of it. Yeah. And apparently, it's a, a fast-growing industry as well. So uh, it's it's an exciting time to be involved in it. Yeah, because I've noticed a lot of my Twitter accounts coming out now of all the new um, U of E sort of like uh, companies coming out now. Aero photography and then a lot of them popping up. It's, yeah. like, it's like almost weekly now. Yeah, yeah, that's mm. right. That's right. So it's going to be quite a hard market to uh, once you get into it. To I think so. Fight for the work. Yeah, I mean, for me, I, I'm I'm um, I'm a social media professional, and I I do social media for marketing purposes. So I work with a lot of companies that um, you know use Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, LinkedIn, Google Plus, all that sort of stuff for for marketing purposes. And I really want to do this just to add a, a, a different dimension to the, the, the creative, because I'm a mobile creative, mm. I, a lot of the content I produce is literally done from my iPhone or, or a GoPro. Yeah. Um, and I just wanted to add a different dimension to some of the content that I create and, and this will definitely do that. But even just to do a 15 second clip for Instagram, if you're getting paid for it, you've got to have a permission to fly. Yeah. It's that simple. Yeah, fair enough. Yeah. Go back in. Go back <laughs> round, I think. Bit of practice. <laughs> Actually, I'm better off taking it off GPS for this. There we go. Ooh, nearly. 
What does it now? Is the up thrust as well? Because it changes direction as well yeah. when you closer. But I'm better off Stay there. Stable though. A bit of an altitude. You can see how stable that is. Yeah, it's good, isn't it? And I'm not in GPS, sir. No. Hey, look at that. That's how you do it.